So we'll now begin with a very important review for the part 2 exam that will tell us about an introduction to credit risk. So credit risk is defined as the risk of an economic loss from the failure of a counterparty to fulfill its contractual obligations. The effect is measured by calculating the cost of replacing the cash flows in case the other party defaults or reneges on its obligations. So if somebody owes me $100 and decides to pay me back only 90 or decides not to pay me anything at all, then all this would be a credit default and the loss would be called a credit loss. Settlement risk is a special credit risk that happens at the time of settlement. So let's say I'm in a fixed for floating swap and I've made my payment in Japanese yen. I'm supposed to receive payment in US dollar. However, after I make the payment, the other party fails to transfer its portion or fails to honor its end of the bargain. So that's called settlement risk, the risk that happens at settlement. To reduce this risk, we often try to follow real-time gross settlement. That is both parties actually press the button together so as to the transfer happens at the same time. Or as we'll study in more detail when we study credit exposure, we can follow a concept of bilateral netting whereby only the net amount needs to be exchanged so the credit risk gets reduced. Similar is the concept of contracts for differences. In multilateral netting systems, if A, B, C have different obligations to each other, then a central counterparty will calculate the net obligation of each to the other and decide the payments. So all these are methods of reducing the settlement risk. We'll study netting and the concepts in more detail in the coming sessions. Now settlement risk in foreign exchange is generally due to the fact that notionals get exchanged or the net value gets exchanged or there are multiple currencies involved or because of the high volatility of exchange rates. The settlement risk in forex is particularly high because unlike interest rate swaps or transactions in the same currencies where the principal doesn't get changed, in a foreign exchange swap the notionals get exchanged right at the beginning. Because of this, the credit risk is particularly high because at maturity, the notionals have to be exchanged back. And then if one counterparty reneges on his obligation, there can be a major loss to the other counterparty. Which of the following statements about multilateral netting systems is not accurate? Systemic risks can actually increase because they concentrate risks on the central counterparty the failure of which exposes all participants to the risk. The statement is correct. We'll study in more detail as I mentioned, but just to understand, A, B, C, D, E are various market participants. A has some exposure to B, B has to C, C has to D, D has to E, and E again has some exposure to A. There's a central counterparty that will look at the whole system and then decide that after netting, that is if A and B both owe each other $10 and that will be netted off. What is the net obligation of each participant to the other? The central counterparty will then receive those cash flows from the counterparties or from the participants who are due to make payments and disburse the payments to the counterparties who are due to receive payments. So after the net cancellation of whatever can be done in the system, let's say C eventually owes $20 to A. So C will pay the central counterparty $20 and the central counterparty will pay A $20. So what this does is actually the risk sometimes can get concentrated on the central counterparty. That's what the first statement says. So the central counterparty receives $20 but fails to pay $20 forward then it can be a big problem. The concentration of risks on the central counterparty eliminates risk because of the high quality of the central counterparty. That is wrong. We just saw the risk gets concentrated. Let's look at the other statements as well for better understanding. By altering settlement costs and credit exposures, multilateral netting systems for foreign exchange contracts could alter the structure of credit relations and affect competition in the forex markets. That is correct because if netting systems work well, 
then exposures can be reduced the capital kept as buffer can be reduced and hence it can affect the market as a whole in payment netting systems participants with net debit positions will be obligated to make a net settlement payment to the central counterparty that in turn is obligated to pay those participants with net credit positions that is also correct as we just understood c would make a payment of $20 and a would receive a net payment of $20 now as we studied credit risk is the risk of a credit default so what are the essential drivers of credit risk or a credit loss so a credit loss will happen if and only if somebody defaults so default is defined as a discrete state for the counterparty either a counterparty is in default or he is not so if he owes me hundred dollars and gives me even one dollar less then he will be said to be in default so there will be some probability of default that we will try to estimate if a counterparty a defaults I will not have a loss unless I have some exposure to the counterparty or I have given the counterparty some loan so credit exposure is the market value of the claim on the counterparty it is also called exposure at default at the time of default and very importantly the extent of the default matters so whether it is a 1% loss or a 30% loss at default whether he pays me 99 or he pays me 70 will determine how much credit loss I suffer so loss given default represents the fractional loss due to default the credit exposure of any instrument is simply whatever we are to receive or zero so credit exposure can never be negative so let's say we enter into a swap with another counterparty and at the current time we are in the money by hundred dollars that is if we offset the swap we would gain hundred dollars in such a case our credit exposure would be hundred dollars let's say if we were short the same swap or we had the opposite position and actually at the current time we had a loss of hundred dollars in that case what will be our credit exposure please note our exposure will be zero because we have to make the payment the credit exposure of the other side would be hundred dollars that is we will be the credit risk in such a case as payment is due from us so credit exposure is the higher of the value of the contract to us or zero it can never be negative if we owe somebody money then we are the credit risk the credit loss on the portfolio can be calculated as the sum of the credit losses on the individual securities or the individual bonds bi represents whether or not the security is in default or not it will either be one or zero one represents the security is in default zero represents there is no default so if there is no default it doesn't matter what the exposure is because there will be no loss if we are in default however we will have to see what is our exposure at default multiplied by the loss given default loss given default can also be written as one minus the recovery rate where f represents the recovery rate or one minus f is the LGD if you were asked to compute the expected credit loss the expected credit loss would simply be the same equation however the Bernoulli variable of either loss or no loss will now be replaced by a probability of loss so expected credit loss is calculated as the probability of default multiplied by the exposure at default multiplied by the loss given default so for the whole portfolio we will calculate the probability of default for each instrument 
and the exposure and the loss given default sum it all up and that will give us our expected credit loss we studied this in copulas as well that the probability of joint default that is the probability of instrument a as well as instrument b defaulting together is given as probability of a into probability of b plus the covariance of a and b and covariance can be written as correlation into the standard deviation of a into the standard deviation of b and being a binomial variable that is there is either default or no default standard deviation of a will be calculated as square root of n p q or square root of n which is 1 the probability of default into 1 minus the probability of default similarly for b it will be the probability of default for b into 1 minus the probability of default for b so an important formula we must try to remember this is the probability that both a and b default together if the correlation is zero that means the two events are independent then probability of a and b will simply be pa into pb so we just calculated that the expected credit loss is equal to the probability of default into the loss given default the loss given default can be calculated as the credit exposure multiplied by the percentage loss given default that is 1 minus the recovery rate so we sum this as the absolute loss given default multiplied by the probability of default for n instruments if we assume that all the n instruments have the same probability of default the expected credit loss will be given as n into p into the expected loss given default if you assume that there was only one instrument or only one bond in our portfolio then we can assume that n is equal to 1 this will give us the expected credit loss as p into the expected loss given default where p is the probability of default now please note that ECL is only the expected credit loss because there is a uncertain probability and there is an uncertain loss given default so this is our expected loss given default it's possible that actually when the default happens the loss was slightly higher or lesser so please note that the probability is also uncertain the loss given default is also uncertain so the expected value of the credit loss will be calculated like this however the variance of the credit loss will depend on the probability of default and the variance of the loss given default so if we are very confident in our loss given default calculation that is the variability of this number is not very high then the variance of the credit loss will also not be high but if the variance of the loss given default is high that is it can be 20% or 30% or 40% with some probability that is it is highly variable then the expected variance or the variance of our credit loss will also be very high so please note that you don't need to know this derivation however you need to remember the formula that the standard deviation of the credit loss will be calculated as p multiplied by the variance of the loss given default plus p into 1 minus p which is nothing but the variance of the probability of default or the variance of default into the expected loss given default squared so if there is one instrument which has a probability of default of p and an expected loss given default of elgd and the variance of this loss given default so the expected value may be 30 but sometimes maybe the loss given default is 10 sometimes it is 50 that is there is some standard deviation and some variance that can be calculated is given as variance of LGD then the standard deviation of the credit loss can be calculated as the square root of P into variance of LGD plus P into 1 minus P into expected LGD square please note it can be proved and derived quite easily you do not need to know the derivation just remember this end result and the formula
you have granted an unsecured loan to a company this loan will be paid off by a single payment of 50 million dollars the company has a 3% chance of defaulting over the life of the transaction and your calculations indicate that if it defaults you would recover 70% of your loan from the bankruptcy courts if you are required to hold a credit reserve equal to your expected credit loss how great a reserve should you hold so the question basically asks us to calculate the expected credit loss the expected credit loss is simply the probability of default into the exposure at default into the loss given default that is 1 minus the recovery rate the probability of default is 3% the credit exposure is 50 million dollars and the loss given default is 1 minus the recovery rate that is 30% or 0.3 so if you want to hold a reserve equal to the expected credit loss then you should keep a reserve of $450,000 a bank has booked a loan with total commitment of $50,000 of which 80% is currently outstanding the default probability of the loan is assumed to be 2% for the next year and loss given default is estimated at 50% so there is a commitment of $50,000 the probability of default loss given default is given the standard deviation of the loss given default is also given the drawdown on default that is the fraction of the undrawn loan is assumed to be 60% so additional 60% would have been drawn down at the time of default the expected and the unexpected losses for the bank are so expected credit loss is the same as we studied the unexpected credit loss is defined as the standard deviation and we are asked to calculate both so let's first calculate the expected credit loss the expected credit loss will be the probability of default that is given to be 2% multiplied by the exposure at default so 80% of the loan is currently outstanding so 80% of 50,000 is outstanding and additional 60% would be drawn down at default so of the remaining amount that is 50 minus 40,000 $10,000 another 60% would be drawn down at default so this will be my total exposure multiplied by the loss given default that is given to be 50 percent so the expected credit loss comes out to be 460 dollars the second part of the question asks us to calculate the unexpected loss that is equal to the standard deviation please recall the standard deviation is defined as the square root of the probability of default into the variance of the loss given default plus the probability of default into 1 minus the probability of default into the expected value of the loss given default squared the probability of default is nothing but 0 0.02 the variance of the loss given default is given to be 40 percent that is a standard deviation so 40 percent squared so this can be calculated as 0.4 squared plus 0 0.02 into 0 0.98 into the expected value of the loss given default squared. So this will be the standard deviation in percentage terms. If we multiply this with our exposure at default, that is $46,000 this will give us the absolute value of the standard deviation or the absolute value of the unexpected loss we will now understand the very important concept of credit VAR with the help of an example 
So let's assume that we have three instruments in our portfolio. Instrument A, we have an exposure of $25 and the probability of default is given to be 5%. Please note, the loss given default in all cases is assumed to be 100% or the recovery rate is zero. So if there is default, there is nothing that comes back. To assure B, the exposure is $30 and the probability of default is 10% and to assure C the exposure is $45 and a probability of default of 20%. In such a scenario, what is the lowest possible credit loss? The lowest possible credit loss is $0 that is when none of the issuers default. So neither A defaults nor B defaults nor C defaults. It is further given that the probability of defaults are independent or issuers A, B, C are independent of one another. So what will be the probability that neither A defaults nor B defaults nor C defaults? So none of the three default. 95% chance that A doesn't default, 90% chance that B doesn't default, and 80% chance that C doesn't default. So the product will come out to be 68.4%. So 68.4% chance that there is zero credit loss or there is no default. What is the next highest possible loss? The next highest possible loss is $25 when only issuer A defaults. The probability of only issuer A defaulting will be calculated as the probability of A defaulting and the probability of B and C not defaulting which will be calculated as 5% chance of A defaulting 90% chance of B not defaulting and an 80% chance of C not defaulting. So there will be a 3.6% probability that A defaults while B and C don't default. So the probability of a $25 loss exactly is 3.6%. If we sum the two probabilities, we will see that there is a 72% chance that the loss is less than or equal to $25 or 28% chance that the loss will be greater than $25. Similarly, the next highest possible loss is $30, which is when only B defaults. So in a similar manner, we can calculate the probability of only B defaulting. So A shouldn't default, B should default, and C should not default that probability will come out to be 7.6%. So roughly about an 80% chance that the loss will be less than or equal to $30. The next highest possible loss is $45 when only C defaults. After that will be $55 when A and B default. Then would be $70 when C and A default, so on and so forth. I can compute the probability of higher and higher losses and present them in this table as depicted. Probability of a hundred dollar loss is when all three defaults. So it will be probability of A into the probability of B into the probability of C that will be calculated as 0 0.05 into 0 0.1 into 0 0.2 and will come out to be 0.1 percent And in all circumstances, our loss will be less than or equal to $100. 0.1% yeah. chance that the loss will exactly be equal to $100. So the third, or rather the fourth column depicts the cumulative probabilities. The fifth column helps us calculate the expected loss. Please remember, the expected loss will simply be the probability of each loss 
multiplied by the amount of each loss. So 68% chance of $0 loss. So this is calculated as 0.684 into 0, which will be 0. 3.6% chance of a $25 loss. 7.6% chance of a $30 loss, so on and so forth. 0.1% chance of a $100 loss, which will come out to be $0.1. So the expected credit loss in this question comes out to be $13.25. If we've calculated the expected credit loss, we can also calculate the variance of the credit loss Variance is nothing but the average of the squared deviations. So for each loss, we can first calculate the deviations. That is 0 minus 13.25, minus 13.25, so on and so forth. Squaring each of these values will give us the squared deviations. And multiplying with the probability and summing them up will give us the average or the expected value of the squared deviations, which is the variance of the credit loss. So the variance of the credit loss comes out to be 434.7, you can verify from the method explained. Square root of this will give us the standard deviation. Now let's assume the question asks us to calculate the credit war at a 97% confidence level. That is, 97% of the times, the loss will be less than equal to or less than this value and 3% of the times, the loss will be greater than or equal to this value. So what is that value? The loss is less than which 25% of the times, rather 3% of the times, and the loss is greater than which? 3% of the times. The loss is less than the war 97% of the times. So we have the cumulative probability charted out. So we can see that 97.1% of the times the loss is less than $55. So if 97.1% of the times the loss is less than 55, then even 97% of the times the loss will be less than $55. So 97% percent worst case value is $55. However, there is some expected loss anyways. So please note that in the distribution of losses, the mean value is not zero like we had in our traditional war questions. The expected value of the loss is $13.25. And 97.1% of the times, the loss is less than or equal to $55. The credit war is defined as this unexpected loss. So 13.25 was expected. 97% of the times, the loss will be less than $55. So credit war is defined as the unexpected loss at a particular confidence level. The unexpected loss in this case will come out to be 55 minus 13.25 that is equal to $41.75. So $41.75 would be the credit VAR or the unexpected loss. So the definition of war remains the same. It is the maximum loss over a given time horizon with a low pre-specified probability that the actual value would exceed that value. Only thing is the lost data now comes from credit losses, not market value fluctuations or not because of market related events. So once again, 97% of the times the loss was less than $55.
or the unexpected loss is less than $41.75. This unexpected loss is the credit war. So 97% of the times the unexpected loss will be less than $41.75 and that is what the war will be. If you plot the distribution of credit losses, 68.4% of the times there is no loss. 3% of the times the loss is $25, 7.6% of the times it is $30, so on and so forth. Roughly about 97% of the times the loss is less than $55. So this area is 97% and this area is about 3% or 97% of the times the unexpected loss that is above 13.25 is less than $55. So the 97% war would be equal to the 97% value minus the expected loss. The 97% value is $55 minus the expected losses $13.25. Similarly, if we were asked to compute the 95% war, then we would say that 96.7% of the times the loss is less than $45. So definitely 95% of the times also the loss will be less than $45. So please note to be conservative, you will take the next higher value, not the next lower value. So 96.7% of the times the loss is less than 45. That means definitely 95% of the times the loss will be less than $45. So at a 95% confidence level, the war would have been calculated as 45 minus 13.25 as depicted in the figure. So 95% war would have been 45 minus 13.25 that is 31.75 so this is the same question as we did earlier four hundred fifty thousand dollars is the answer an investor holds a portfolio of hundred million dollars the portfolio consists of a rated bonds and triple b rated bonds assume that the one year probabilities of default for A rated and triple B rated bonds are 3% and 5% respectively and that they are independent. If the recovery value for A rated bonds in the event of a default is 70% and the recovery value for triple B rated bonds is 45%, what is the one year expected credit loss from this portfolio? It's a very easy question. So the expected credit loss will simply be the expected credit loss from one plus the expected credit loss from the other since the two are independent probabilities. So it will be 40 into 0 0.03 into 0.3 plus 60 into 0 0.05 into 0.55 if we sum it up, we will get our answer. Calculate the probability of a subsidiary and a parent company both defaulting over the next year. Assume that the subsidiary will default if the parent defaults, but the parent will not necessarily default if the subsidiary defaults. So there is a parent company and the parent has a subsidiary so if parent defaults then definitely subsidiary also defaults but only if the subsidiary defaults doesn't necessarily mean that the parent will also default so the parent has a one year probability of default of 50 percent and the subsidiary has a one year probability of default of 90%. Question asked, 
is what is the probability of the subsidiary and the parent company both defaulting. Please note, this is a nice trick question. So if the parent defaults, subsidiary is always in default. So if the parent is defaulting, both of them are defaulting. And the subsidiary defaulting anyways has no bearing on the parent defaulting. So the probability of both of them defaulting will be the same as the probability of the parent defaulting because event A, that is the parent defaulting, automatically assumes or automatically entails that the subsidiary also defaults. So 50% chance of the parent defaulting and given the question, there's a 50% chance that both of them will default as when the parent defaults, the subsidiary also defaults. A portfolio manager has been asked to take the risk related to the default of two securities A and B. She has to make a large payment if and only if both A and B default. For taking this risk, she will be compensated by receiving a fee. What can be said about this fee? Please note that a large payment is due only if both A and B default together. The fee will be larger if the default of A and B are highly correlated. That's true. If A and B are highly correlated, then high likelihood that the fee will need to be paid and hence she will charge a higher fee because the payment will more likely to be paid and hence for giving somebody this, this assurance that when A and B both default, I will make a contingent payment. I will start charging a higher fee if I see a correlation of default between A and B is very high. Fee will be smaller if they are not correlated. Fee is independent of the correlation that is correct, that is incorrect. Then none of the above is correct is also incorrect. So the fee will be larger if the default of A and B are highly correlated. A portfolio consists of two assets of 100 million pounds each. The probability of default over the next year is 10% for the first asset, 20% for the second asset, and the joint probability of default is 3%. Estimate the expected loss on this portfolio due to credit defaults over the next year assuming 40% recovery rate for both assets. Please note, only the expected credit loss has been asked. So when expected credit loss is asked, the joint probability of default doesn't matter. Because expected loss will simply be the probability of default of A plus the probability of default of B. If the variance or something like that was asked, then of course the joint probability or the correlation between the two would make a difference. Please note we can see here that A and B are not independent events. Since probability of A and B, that is the joint default of both is given to be 3%. It is not equal to PA into PB, that would just be 10 into 20, that is 2%. So there is some correlation between the two. So PA and B is higher than this to the extent of the covariance of A and B. However, in the expected credit loss, this doesn't matter. So the probability of A into the credit exposure of A into the loss given default of A plus the similar calculation for B will give us the answer. So it will be 10% into 100 <coughs> into 0.6, that is the expected credit loss from A, plus 20% into 100 into 0.6, that is the expected credit loss from B, which will come out to be 18 million pounds.
we can verify this with a more detailed calculation as well just to help you understand the concept better there is a 10% chance that A defaults there is a 20% chance that B defaults and there is a 3% chance that both A and B default so what is the probability of only A defaulting it will be 7% the probability of only B defaulting similarly will be 17%. So 7% of the times only A defaults. That is the loss will be 100 million into 0 0.6. 3% of the times both A and B default. That is the loss will be 200 million dollars into 0 0.6 because both A and B default and 17% of the times only B defaults because 20% is the total probability 3% is the joint probability so 17% of the times the loss will again be 100 into 0.6 if we sum this up we will again come to 18 million pounds consider an A rated bond and a triple B rated bond assume that the one year probabilities of default for the A and triple B rated bonds are 2% and 4% respectively and the joint probability of default of the two bonds is 0.15% what is the default correlation between the two bonds so we will apply a formula probability of A and B is given as the probability of A into the probability of B plus the covariance of A and B. Covariance of A and B can be written as correlation into the product of the standard deviations which can be written as the correlation into PA into 1 minus PA into PB into 1 minus PB the square root. So let's substitute the values. A intersection B is given to be 0.15 probability of A is given to be 2%, the probability of B defaulting is given to be 4%, we keep everything in decimals, plus the correlation into square root of 0 0.02 into 0 0.98 into the square root of 0 0.04 into 0 0.96. So this comes out to be equal to so this is a linear equation with rho as the only variable <laughs> so rho comes out to be approximately 2.6 percent a portfolio of bonds consists of five bonds whose default correlation is zero. The one year probabilities of default for the bonds are 1%, 2%, 5%, 10 and 15%. What is the probability of no default within the portfolio? So very similar to the credit war problem that we solved. So what is the probability that none of the bonds default if the default correlations are zero? It will simply be the probability of A not defaulting multiplied by the probability of B not defaulting multiplied by the probability of C not defaulting D not defaulting and E not defaulting the probability of all of them defaulting would have similarly been calculated by just multiplying all the given probabilities of default this comes out to be 71 percent Similarly, there are 10 bonds in a credit default swap basket. The probability of default for each of the bonds is 5%. The probability of any one bond defaulting is completely independent of what happens to the other bonds. What is the probability that exactly one bond defaults? So there are 10 bonds and we are asked to calculate the probability that exactly one bond defaults it could be anyone out of the 10 bonds 
any one could have defaulted and all the others should not have defaulted. So we will apply the binomial theorem to solve the problem. So in 10 trials, if I want exactly one success, then the probability would be given as 10 C1 P to the power R 1 minus P that is 0.95 to the power N minus R. If you've forgotten this concept, you can watch the part 1 video on probability distributions or you can review the class on backtesting war for FRM part 2. Both these places we explain this concept in detail again. This comes out to be approximately 32%. Now we studied how to calculate the standard deviation of the credit losses. It is generally seen that if we have many credits of lower value, then that is seen to be better than having just one credit of a high value. So if you have one credit of a hundred million dollars wherein the probability of default is let's say one percent and there is hundred percent loss given default so the expected loss will be one million that is hundred million into one percent and the standard deviation of loss if we calculate from our formula that we applied earlier will come out to be very high it will be ten million dollars if instead of one credit of hundred million we had 10 credits of 10 million with an expected or a probability of default of 1% and 100% loss given default then again the expected loss would have come out to be 1 million dollars but the standard deviation of loss would have come out to be much lower that is only 3 million as against the 10 million earlier again if we had 100 independent credits of 1 million the standard deviation would have been even lower and 1000 independent credits of 100,000 our risk or our standard deviation of the expected credit loss would have been even lower. So this is the concept of credit risk diversification. So if you have one concentrated loan, then the probability of a big loss increases because if that one person defaults, then it can be a huge outcome to the company. If you have a more diversified portfolio, then the probability of an extreme loss goes down. 